Welcome to What That Means with Camille, where we take the confusion out of tech jargon and encourage more meaningful conversation about cybersecurity. Here is your host, Camille Moorhart. Welcome to today's show. This is Cybersecurity Inside. What that means, we're going to talk about incident response and remediation communications. We've got with us Jerry Bryant and Krobe, both directors within the communications group within the Intel Security Center of Excellence. Welcome, guys. Hey, Camille. Great to be here. It is really great to have you here, partially because I am Vanna Whiting, a merch from these gentlemen's podcast. They have a podcast called Chips and Salsa, and we'll talk a little bit about that too. But first of all, let's get started by understanding what is communications, incident response, and remediation communications. You want to start off, Jerry, and then I'll fill in? I'll start off, sure. Every technology company has to deal with product vulnerabilities. In this particular sense, you know, we deal with product vulnerability issues. Sometimes they become an incident if they're publicly disclosed by an external researcher or somehow it's leaked out there or found being used in some sort of an attack against customers. That's an incident that we respond to. So we develop a communications plan, which involves a whole process of understanding the issue, understanding where we are with a potential mitigation, what other things do our customers need to know, and then putting out those communications with the clear goal of providing actionable information for our customers. A lot of orchestration and coordination amongst just the industry and our customers to make sure that as problems are found, they're able to quickly get addressed and corrected to minimize the risk that an end user would have. We had a conversation with Lisa Bradley of Dell. She's in the PCERT team there. And I'm wondering if you guys can explain how you work with the PCERT team or you know, PCERT's actually taking in reports of vulnerabilities and then triaging them and then working with engineering across the company to come up with mitigations, updates, et cetera. So how does the communications team work with that group? It's a good question because I always refer to ourselves as the communications arm of the PCERT. Hmm. PCERT drives the vulnerability management process, you know, from intake to triage to mitigation to disclosure. It's our job to, as we get towards the public disclosure of that, to develop the strategy and the comms to go with that issue. So what the customer, again, what the customers need to know, where's the mitigation, how they should look at their risk factors, things like that. So that's the kind of stuff we try to manage as we get to that public disclosure phase. And we're also consultants with the PCERT, you know, as they have reports, they, we help provide feedback on that comm strategy Jerry talked about. We think about what types of impacts could happen if it gets out in the media too soon, or the types of questions customers or um, partners might ask about the particular problem. So we're really consultants, they're a sister team. And like Jerry said, we, we provide that service of communications for them to try to help make sure things run smoothly and everyone's clearly informed. If it's an external researcher, What's their history when they report an issue? You know, what can we expect from them? Do they like to develop some sort of uh, branding for the vulnerability they discovered or whatever? That all kind of informs us as the communications guys or gals to develop the right strategy, sometimes proactively, because we know there's enough triggers that this thing is going to maybe end up being a media story and that generally causes a lot of customer questions to come in. And so we proactively prepare for that stuff ahead of time, given what those triggers are that we see that may come to fruition. And some issues are very complex and they require some more in-depth conversation about how to mitigate it or what the issue is. And a lot of times uh, the PCERT team or a product engineering team that's, they're focused on developing the solution, trying to get that thing fixed, and they're not necessarily understanding that this is a really hard problem and somebody that's gonna implement this fix might need to take additional steps. So we provide that feedback and have the, the appropriate level of 
uh, artifacts to kind of share that information. One of the things you said that I thought was a little intriguing is you mentioned looking at sort of the personality or the history of a person who may have reported a vulnerability. And that then informing maybe your even approach to communications, do you actually work with the very people who are reporting a vulnerability on communicating it back out to the public? Sometimes. It, it depends on who that organization or entity is. And I've heard the term coordinated vulnerability disclosure, which sounds very fancy. And I'm wondering, what is that? And why does that have to exist? Why can't a company just be completely transparent with the public from the very beginning of understanding there's an issue? Back in the early 2000s, it used to be called responsible disclosure. And of course, the security research community took offense to that because, you know, a lot of people rightfully so believe that they find something, they should be able to disclose it. But the idea behind coordinated vulnerability disclosure is that the researcher who found the issue works with the vendor whose code the issue is in to get a mitigation in place and distributed to their end customers before you publicly disclose the details of the vulnerability. That way the ecosystem has a chance to develop a fix and get it deployed you know, before those details are out and can then be used in potential exploits. It's really making sure that everybody that's involved in that disclosure, downstream suppliers, that everybody's prepared and ready so that when it goes public, that the end user that's using this hardware or software has the, the smallest window of risk. They have access to the fixes um, as quickly as possible when it goes public so that their opportunity to get exploited is greatly reduced. You do that by kind of orchestrating and you know, talking through everybody that needs to be informed so that they can be prepared when the starting gun goes off. Multiple people, multiple parties might have the information and could disclose at any moment, but they're agreeing to work together to kind of roll it out in concert with a mitigation or an update. For example, Intel runs several bug bounties. You know, researchers find a vulnerability, they could submit it to our bug bounty and Depending on the severity of the issue, they they can get some money from our bounty program. But the terms they agree to are that they will follow coordinated vulnerability disclosure with us. And it's all about managing and reducing risk. And these researchers, they are doing this investigation because they legitimately want to make things better. And when they go through programs like a bug bounty or a VDP, vulnerability disclosure program that a vendor might have, they are doing that because they want to make that particular product uh, better and they want to help protect that community of users. I want to talk about the product security report. This is something that is relatively new, put out by Intel. Can you describe what it is and why it started? I started at Intel in 2019. And at the end of that calendar years, when I created the first product security report and you know, the, the reason behind it was more to show the investment that Intel makes in product security assurance. When you think about vulnerabilities, there's often comparisons out there between companies and how many vulnerabilities they have in their products. So we were seeing where there's news stories comparing us with one of our close competitors and wow, Intel has 200 and 35 vulnerabilities that they addressed in 2019, and their competitor only has eight. But when you start to look at the numbers, you find that, oh, wow, 60% of the vulnerabilities that Intel addressed, they found themselves through their own internal research. And, oh, wow, their competitor doesn't report anything they find internally. So there's this commitment to transparency that we have through our Security First pledge which drives us to publish the information about stuff we find internally. Therefore, our customers can make a more accurate risk assessment. So there's all this about the investment that we make. There's also, we try to include information in there on what Intel employees are doing out in the ecosystem to better the state of securities. You know, ISO standards, help me out, Crow. 
like uh, participation in industry groups like FIRST or OpenSSF or other things, IEEE? I mean, we have people out there contributing to building new standards in hardware debug security. And everywhere we look, we don't see our competitors. We just had these announcements coming out of Vision, you know, around open source. So our CEO, Pat Gelsinger, has an open letter to the open community pledging that Intel is going to support open source initiatives. That came out also that over the last five years, you know, Intel has invested over $250 million in open source security. And uh, on chips and salsa, we're, we're doing a video series right now on open source security and the individuals within Intel that are doing things like Linux kernel, they're building Linux kernel fuzzers and open sourcing those fuzzers and all the scripts that we do. I mean, it's incredible as we dig into it, you know, and uncover more and more, it's incredible how many people at Intel are actively engaged out there trying to build better standards improve standards, and make the ecosystem a safer place. It's interesting to think about these common good type efforts that we participate in that benefit the whole global community. It's pretty amazing. So you guys brought up chips and salsa. I have my my packet right here with me, ready for a little morning snack. <laughs> Talk about that. You guys started a podcast together. It's very cool. It's very informative. You go deep with Intel experts and really talk with them about some of the very specific things that they're working on. And I think you uncover things that are not well known, frankly. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what was surprising to you when you started digging in and talking with experts within the company. I'm a relatively newbie to the organization, and it's just amazing to think about the depth and breadth of talent and efforts that our folks are doing on so many different levels. We've interviewed folks about Long-Term Retention Hub down in Costa Rica, and that was an amazing project that allows us to have this huge back catalog of products that as we have we're testing out you know, new features or new patches or security vulnerability fixes. We have the ability to test back through 10 years of our products, which is a capability that didn't exist. And it's just interesting to kind of be reminded of just the, the raw talent of some of these folks and the interesting things they're doing. Like we talked with Jason Fung, who's contributing to upstream efforts for a program called CWE, Weakness Enumeration. And that it's a vulnerability thing where that's describing kind of the root cause of a software or hardware problem. Well, he was key in orchestrating getting the creation of hardware CWEs so that to help kind of explain problems in hardware, which is, you know, was brand new. And it's just you know, constantly we're not stumbling, but we're be being introduced to people that you work with every day. You're in meetings all the time with and to kind of understand the portfolio and the breadth of what they're bringing to the community and the company. It's amazing. Or I think some things like that you're saying, because we may be familiar with common weakness enumeration. In fact, we did do a podcast where Katie Noble described that for us. I think it's called risk mitigation and vulnerability management. But to then discover that somebody that you know you sit next to or you virtually sit next to actually was instrumental in adding the hardware portion of that to the entire industry, it's very cool. You know, that's the kind of thing that I think that I've discovered listening to your podcast, it's like, oh, I just assumed, you know, either that always existed or that it was sort of created not by the very person sitting next to me that I am now and then to ask a simple question, right? <laughs> One of the takeaways customers should have if they go through and watch Chips and Salsa videos is, is the focus <laughs> of Intel employees outside of Intel more than any other company I've ever worked for. Intel is like broadly out. So it's just in strange places too. So our, the first chips and salsa episode we did was with Enrique Carrero and he's out working in the debug standards groups, but specifically driving debug standards for security, trying to build new norms and standards. You know, and and how debugging is done on computers. 
in a secure manner. We have this guy at Intel that's extremely passionate about this and loves working with these groups and driving these new standards. And again, our competitors aren't even involved. I really have enjoyed capturing that content and being able to draw that out of the folks we're talking with and to highlight something that they might have thought, oh, this is just something I do in my spare time and it realized the impact of this. So I've really enjoyed that about the podcast. It's always fun watching people have dogs fight in the background or kids <laughs> run around without diapers. Are you going to keep it virtual? We're thinking about Maybe. potentially traveling to some conferences if the world uh, gets a little better and going out and doing some live interviews with conference speakers, maybe some security researchers. I think that brings a whole set of interesting challenges going remote mobile. We are in the process of building a little mobile kit for us to be able to get out on the road. So that'll be fun. There you have it. Chips and Salsa, Jerry Bryant and Krobe from Intel's communications group also talking about their podcast. Really good to have you guys on. Never miss an episode of What That Means with Camille by following us here on YouTube. You can also find episodes wherever you get your podcasts. The views and opinions expressed are those of the guests and author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Intel Corporation. Thank you.